Irreversible inhibitors are molecules that bind onto active sites of enzymes and inhibit that enzyme's functionality, inhibit their activity. Now the thing about these irreversible inhibitors is they can bind onto the active site either by covalent or non-covalent means, but once they bind onto that active site, they will not let go. And that means they bind very, very tightly, very, very strongly. And even if we remove access inhibitor from that mixture, that will not dissociate that inhibitor, that will not reform that active version of the enzyme. So all the different types of inhibitors, irreversible inhibitors that we have in nature and that we can synthesize in a lab can basically be categorized into three different groups, into three different categories. We have group specific inhibitors, we have substrate analogs also known as affinity labels, and we have suicide inhibitors also known as mechanism based inhibitors. Now we can actually use these three different types of irreversible inhibitors to actually probe and study the residues found inside active sites of enzymes. And out of these three different types of groups, the most specific type of group is the suicide inhibitor. And the least specific type of group is the group specific inhibitor. So let's begin by discussing the group specific inhibitor. Well, the group specific inhibitor is an example of an irreversible inhibitor that binds to and reacts with specific side chain groups of amino acids. For instance, on the board, we have two examples of group specific inhibitors. We have idoacetamide that reacts with cysteine side chains, and we also have diisopropyl phosphofluoridate, or simply DIP. PF that reacts with serine amino acids. For instance, if we take an enzyme that contains an active site and inside that active site we have a catalytic amino acid, namely uh, the cysteine, well then this idoacetamide will react with that catalytic amino acid, the cysteine, to form a covalent bond between this carbon here and this sulfur atom here. And because this is the sulfur atom, part of the side chain of the cysteine that is used to basically um, a catalyze some specific type of reaction because we form a covalent bond as shown in the following diagram that essentially deactivates and inhibits the activity of that particular enzyme. And so as a result of this covalent modification, we essentially deactivate that active site of the enzyme. And notice in this process, we essentially kick off the iodide and we also break off that H atom. And so we form this molecule as shown here. The H has a positive charge, the iodine has a negative charge. Now this is the other example and in this particular case we see that diisopropyl phosphofluoridate actually reacts with serine amino acids. For instance we know that in the active site of acetylcholinesterase we have these serine amino acids that catalyze the reactions and so if we mix this active site, so an enzyme that contains an active site with a serine, then this diisopropyl phosphofluoridate will essentially form a covalent bond between this phosphor and this oxygen and that will kick off the F, the fluoride, and also that H to form the following covalent modification. And so these are two examples of group specific irreversible inhibitors. Now let's move on to the second type of category known as substrate analogs or more or more um, uh, more commonly affinity labels. So the thing about these affinity labels is the structure of that particular irreversible inhibitor actually resembles the structure of the natural substrate that binds into the active site of that enzyme. So these irreversible inhibitors are molecules that resemble substrates and this allows them to actually fit into the active site of that enzyme and once inside they essentially react in a covalent manner, they modify the residues found inside the active site in a covalent manner and that inhibits that enzyme's activity. 
Now, what's one example of an affinity label? Well, when we'll discuss the process of glycolysis, we'll see that an intermediate molecule in glycolysis is known as dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And what happens in glycolysis is dihydroxyacetone phosphate is transformed into another isomer by an enzyme we call triose phosphate isomerase. Now, inside the active side of, tri of a triose phosphate isomerase, we have this glutamate molecule. And this glutamate molecule, the amino acid glutamate, essentially is responsible for this catalyzation process from transforming hyd uh, dihydroxyacetone phosphate into another isomer. Now, if we add bromoacetyl phosphate this molecule into the mixture notice how this is almost exactly the same in structure as this original natural substrate the only difference is instead of this hydroxyl group we have this bromide and because of that this will act as a su as a uh, substrate analog and affinity label and what happens is this carbon here reacts with this oxygen to form a covalent bond, a covalent modification. And that kicks off that bromide. In the process, because we form the covalent modification, that essentially inactivates the active side of that enzyme, the triose phosphate isomerase. And now this enzyme cannot convert this molecule, the dihydroxyacetone phosphate, into its isomeric form. And we'll talk much more about about that in our discussion on glycolysis. Now let's take a look at the final category, suicide inhibitors. So these are the most specific type of irreversible inhibitors. And what that means is we can build and we can use these suicide inhibitors to basically bind to specific active sites of specific enzymes. Now, suicide inhibitors are also known as mechanism-based inhibitors. And that's because these suicide inhibitors, they can actually bind onto the active site of that enzyme and begin the normal catalyzation process as if this was a normal substrate molecule. However, down the line, somewhere down that pathway of that reaction, what will happen is that suicide inhibitor will produce a reactive intermediate that will modify the active site in some covalent way. And once that modification takes place, that inhibits that enzyme irreversibly. And so two examples that we commonly use in medicine of suicide inhibitors is penicillin and aspirin. So remember in our discussion on irreversible inhibitors, we said that penicillin is essentially an antibiotic and this penicillin molecule binds into the active site of a specific type of enzyme used by bacterial cells to build bacterial cell walls. And this enzyme is known as transpeptidase. So bacteria Bacterial cells use transpeptidase to basically build cell walls. And what penicillin does is it acts as a suicide inhibitor, that is, it binds into the active site of that enzyme and it begins the catalyzation process, but somewhere down that line, it forms an intermediate that essentially blocks and inhibits the activity of that enzyme, the transpeptidase. Now, aspirin, which has the following structure, is a suicide inhibitor to an enzyme we call, ox we call cyclooxygenase. And what cyclooxygenase normally does is it, ba is it basically catalyzes the formation of a special type of signal molecule that is used in the inflammation process. And so when we actually ingest aspirin, aspirin acts as a suicide inhibitor and it binds into the active site of that cyclooxygenase. And so what that does is it disables the ability to produce that signal molecule and so the inflammation process cannot take place properly. And so that relieves pain, it decreases pain, it removes headaches and so forth. So another type of suicide inhibitor that we commonly use is AZT. And AZT is a molecule that acts as a suicide inhibitor and it basically treats HIV.
So these are the three different types of irreversible inhibitors. So we have group specific inhibitors, which are basically these irreversible inhibitors that bind onto specific groups, specific residues, specific amino acids. We have substrate analogs, also known as affinity labels, that essentially resemble that substrate. And so they can fit into the active site of that substrate and modify that particular active site in some covalent way. And we also have suicide inhibitors that basically bind into that substrate, uh, bind into the active side, and they begin the normal process as if they would, as if they were the normal substrate molecule, but somewhere down that reaction pathway, they essentially create a reactive intermediate that modifies the catalytic residue found inside the active site in some covalent way. And that inhibits the activity of that enzyme.